Let's talk about first the fact that they seem to be nosing around on whether... First they ask, like, are we the only ones who ever see them? Is this just a uniquely American thing? And the answer was no. There have been reports from other countries, including China. And then there was a, a little bit more probing on that. Uh, here is just a bit, let me, just for the audience, it's um, Representative Brad Wenstrup, Democrat from Ohio, questioning the witnesses about the potential of foreign adversary uh, data on this subject. Listen. There are other people besides uh, the U.S. that have had these experiences and reported them. Is that correct? There are. That's correct. Uh, is it uh, all of our allies or is it allies and adversaries? What have we learned publicly? So some of that, I think, sir, will save for closed session. Well, that goes my next question. Publicly, have others sit, made anything which would not have to be considered closed? So I don't want you to answer what they've said necessarily. A allies closed. have uh, have seen these. China has established its own version of a UAP task force. So uh, clearly, a number of countries have observations of uh, uh, of things in the airspace that they can't identify. And uh, do we share data with some, with all? Are they sharing with us? We share data with some, and some share data with us. But not necessarily all that have publicly reported something. That's correct. My God, it's like pulling teeth. Just tell the story, man. Right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, it's it's a little more difficult than that. I can tell you when I was running the HIP program uh, some years ago, um, this is certainly nothing new. Uh, a lot of times, some officials are forced to dance around the topic. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, if I may, Megan, um, what I find so fascinating here, um, along the lines of information sharing, it's now laws, as most people probably know, the the bill that was co-sponsored by Senator Gillibrand and Senator Marco Rubio was pretty historic in itself, truly a bipartisan bill that went forward and, and is now law. And within that law, it requires, it enjoins the United States of America to work with its friends and allies, international allies, on this topic. It's not a choice. We have to. But here we go into some of the contradictory statements now that I mentioned earlier on. If you listen to the hearing, um, you have this impression that there's this huge, robust effort underway. We're working with our friends and our allies, and we have analysts on board. We're working with the academic communities. But in reality, that's not quite so accurate. In fact, a couple months ago, the Department of Defense, when asked, how many people do you have working on this? They said, we have exactly two full-time people working on this topic. Hmm. Um, so that's problematic, right? There's not a whole lot of analysis and information sharing you can do when you only have two people assigned. Yes, they say all hands on deck, but that's only four hands. That's really not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> we really point. need to, to, yeah, we really need to leverage a, a lot more. Um, furthermore, there were some other very interesting things I noted. For example, they talk about one of the questions from the senators. And by the way, let me just say this. The, the, the Forgive me, the congressmen, the reps, uh, not the senators, the uh, members of the House, the committee members were very, very prepared for this. Um, they obviously knew the right questions to ask. And what they were trying to do, in my opinion, was establish a baseline or, if you will, paint a box around the Department of Defense uh, for this particular hearing, knowing that they can come back time and time again and say, well, you said this and now we are seeing this and hold them accountable. Um, if I may, I I'd like to, to bring your attention to, to one of the points that I found interesting. Sure. A question was asked where they, they said, well, are you familiar with our, our nuclear assets being interfered with? And what they're referring to is the, the famous Maelstrom uh, incident where we had our, an entire flight of, of our nuclear missiles deactivated by a UFO. And in fact, not only did you have the commander of that flight come out and, and inform members of Congress, uh, but there was actually intelligence information reports, IIRs, that were written and submitted and have been released through FOIA. The mere fact that the task force members indicated that we have no idea about that and no, we don't have anything but anecdotal information is absolutely shocking to me because that's extremely low hanging fruit. Anybody right now, even with a computer, can get into Google and pull some of these what were formerly very, very classified reports that have now been released to the public. They're there. They exist. So why isn't this information being incorporated into the new, what we call the AIM office or AOIMSG office. 
Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem very smart. Um, you say you're doing let, this, let, this. Let, let me set this yeah. up because um, we have a soundbite. This is Representative Mike Gallagher, Republican from Wisconsin, uh, qu- questioning one of the uh, those testifying about Maelstrom Air Force Base in Cascade County, Montana, back in 1967. Uh, and there's a description of what happened and then what we've gleaned from it. Here it is. One such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable. At the same time, a glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it and whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray, if you've been looking at the UAPs over the last three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay, but are you aware of the, the report, or that the data exists somewhere? Uh, I, have, uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident? Uh, all I can speak to is, you know, what's within my cognizance of the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I, would say, I mean, it's a pretty high-profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in, in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your attention? I'm bringing it to your attention. Sure, so. This is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it, but generally there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, um, there are probably a, a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we have a resource to do that right now. Some authority figure. Do, yeah. do I qualify? Please do it. Right. And, <laughs> and you know, something that he says that, that that comes out there through, through you know, the general public, we'd have to look at, no, this actually, you were the source of it. <laughs> DOD, this is this happened to your assets and equities, and you actually wrote an intelligence report and an oh assessment on this. And to say that it's not part of the calculus is, is it's I, it's unconscionable. I don't understand how someone can can actually say that that well, it's what well. What do you it's, guess, Lou? What's happening that, there? What, what do you think is happening there? Well, I think there's some obfuscation. If someone doesn't think that that manipulating our nuclear assets and equities is a national security imperative, then you might need to find another job, uh, especially if you're in the national security arena. Furthermore, there's some other interesting notes I picked up. You know, they they talk about. Blue force, uh, blue on blue, and we, they said we're, we're sure this is not our technology. Which, which, is, by the way, is probably a very accurate. Explain assessment. that because because we and don't then, know what that is right now. Explain what blue on so, blue is. So, so blue force is the way we say in the vernacular uh, a friendly technology. If this is a blue force technology, this is something we, the United States, or our allies, have developed. And so, the three main things you want to look at with the UAP is it our technology, secret technology that's been maybe tested in in a, in a vacuum or in a bubble and. We haven't told everybody else about it. Is it foreign technology or adversarial technology, Russia, China, uh, or is it something else? Now, what I find very interesting during his testimony, they they say, for the record, well, this is not a blue force technology. This isn't our technology. It's not friendly technology. But then they turn around. They also say, well, we're pretty sure it's not adversarial technology. Uh, well, we know that because China and Russia have their own UAP programs, too. Mm. So if you're telling me it's not our technology and it's not foreign or adversarial technology, then what is it? I mean, it, it's it's I think it's it's a silly way to dance around the topic. I understand social stigma and taboo, but let's let's call it for what it is. If you don't know what it is, then say you don't know what it is. Um, but let's not try to confuse the topic with Congress by by trying to explain away things as a drone or a quadcopter. Let's face it, a, a quadcopter can't fly at supersonic speeds and at 35,000 feet and fly around and then hover over a warship for three hours. We just don't have that technology yet. Um, these are some of the basic questions that need to be answered because these are some of the basic things we are actually encountering with our military forces. Um, I'll tell you another point how, they're, how they're, I see them threading the needle on this very cleverly. One of the questions was asked, well, do you acknowledge ATIP? Yes, we acknowledge that the fact that ATIP existed, which was my program. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, of course, they acknowledge Blue Blue Book, Project Blue Book, which occurred back in the 70s and and closed sometime in the 70s. 
But there's no mention of any programs in between. And in fact, when they asked the question, I believe it was Representative Gallagher who said, are you going back and looking at any of the data that has, may have been obtained through other programs and efforts? The answer was no. Yeah, they said no. Well, yeah. How, wait a minute. Aren't you the Department of Defense and aren't you in charge of looking back at all the data that we have in our history? Because what we do know for a fact, everybody is aware of the Tic Tac event, the Nimitz event that occurred in 2004 involving two two F-18s that went to go do an intercept mission and encountered this flying white Tic Tac. What most people don't know is that same flying white Tic Tac was also described in the 50s and 60s as a flying white throat lozenge or a flying white butane tank, all doing the same thing, flying at mm. 13,000 miles and able to conduct right angle turns. So this data is important. Uh, what you want to do is collect as much historical data as you can and then compare and contrast that data to the information we have currently and see if we can identify trends and commonalities. Um, that should be order number one because we spent a lot of your taxpayer money looking at this, um, it would be nice to know that we're not going to try to reinvent the wheel here and at least pull up that data that you already paid yeah. for. Inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. Interest rates are skyrocketing and a recession could soon be coming. Caught between runaway inflation and a recession, our retirement accounts are in real danger, and you know that if you ever check them. If you want to protect your future, call the precious metal dealers, I trust, American Hartford Gold. They can show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. It's all about diversification. All it takes to get started is a short phone call. They will have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. American Hartford Gold makes it easy. They are the highest rated firm in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, and they have thousands, thousands of satisfied clients. Call them now, and they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first qualifying order. Call 866-518-2955. That's 866-518-2955. Or you can just text my name, M-E-G-Y-N, Megan, to 65532. 65532. Okay? So, that, again, that's call 866-518-2955. Or text my name, Megan, to 65532. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.